my name is Andrew Betwain. I'm the editor of insuranceinvestor.com and today I am joined by Rip Reeves, who is the Chief Investment, so Investment Officer of Aegis Insurance. Rip, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Rip will be speaking at our Institutional Fixed Income Investor North America 2022 Summit, which will be online on the 19th of October, and he'll be doing a fireside chat about the challenges of being a fixed income manager today. So Rip, to start us off, can you talk us through the challenges that you see in the fixed income world? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, I would think some of the biggest changes that we've seen is just in the technology, uh, in the use of technology. Uh, tons of product development, like ETFs, for example. Uh, you've seen a lot of structuring, uh, finance type things that reshapes the risk uh, of various uh, types of collateral. Mm. Uh, and you've also seen a lot of regulatory requirements that have come down the pipe, like enterprise risk management, ESG, for example. And what a lot of these collectively tend to do from, from my perspective is it kind of reduces the predictive value of some of the judgments that we've made and you know our historical relationships and correlations that we look at mm. actually meaningful anymore uh, because there are a number of uh, channels that are, are feeding into uh, the technical and the, the price market volatility that we're seeing um, you know and and if you're looking at a specific environment like we've had in 2021 as well as year to date in 2022 from a fixed income standpoint uh, the, the, the only name to the game right now is really pure defense because you've got mm. every asset class from cash uh, to or, or uh, effective cash to um, uh, to high yield and everything throughout the investment grade universe that's that's generating negative returns. Uh, so there's really no no place to hide at the moment. So uh, you know all of these technol technological advances, the regulatory requirements, uh, a lot of what we're seeing is just generally reducing the predictive value of the judgments that we make in the investment strategy uh, and increasing the, the, the amount of volatility. That's a really good answer and thank you for that. And you mentioned there playing defense and I think that's a really good point and it kind of leads on to my next question which is what is what is your thoughts on the Fed and the actions that they've taken over the past year in terms of inflation, in terms of balancing the economy and has this helped or has it made the market more challenging? Uh, well, first of all, it's a loaded question, but thank you. <laughs> uh, the Fed's reaction, uh, initially anemic. Uh, there was none. I, if you remember back in uh, uh, the middle and the latter part of 21, er, uh, everything that we were seeing from an inflation trans, uh, from an inflation standpoint was described as transitory. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think the market thought that, but that was certainly the political uh, uh, answer that we were getting. Um, and part of what we're seeing right now with 50 basis points and probably 75 basis points in the next meeting, uh, they're, they're playing catch up at the moment. Mm -hmm. What this means for us in the marketplace uh, is that there is less of a very methodical move to uh, be less accommodated than they've been over the past several years. And generally speaking, certainly the fixed income markets, uh, as well as the risk markets, don't like that. Mm. Uh, so any kind of surprise uh, that, you know, like the uh oh, this isn't so transitory and look, look how look how fast we have to react to this The market tends not to like this. So, so again, going back to the first question, less predictive value of, of what we're what we're looking at in some of the historical relationships. And all you have to do is look at the negative returns in the fixed income market, the public fixed income market. And the level of negative returns in investment grade corporates, treasuries, agencies, agency mm -hmm. mortgage backed securities, their, their current year to date negative returns are, are far beyond their historical standard deviation of returns. So we're looking at the quote unquote fat left tail events, which is indicative of, hey, we've been surprised and this is not good. So more volatility, less predictive value. Interesting. Some really interesting points there. So. Moving on from that, we've kind of got the reason that we have this this Fed anemia, as you described it initially. In the post-pandemic, high inflation, rising interest rates, interest rates market that we find ourselves in, what are some of the ways to find the benefits, if there are any, to this situation? <laughs> Wait a minute. Are we post-pandemic? I, I, I didn't think that <laughs> Apparently, that according to the politicians, we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
posting it, oh, yeah, that's, that, this is going to be a little uh, on the negative side, trying to find, uh, you know, some lemonade with the lemons. But <laughs> in, a, in, a, in, a, in an odd way, uh, I guess one of the benefits of, of what we're experiencing, certainly in the fixed income markets in 21 and so far year to date in 22, and I would expect throughout the rest of this year and possibly uh, well into next year, it's a good education. Uh, mm. For a lot of us in the markets, you know, we have been very spoiled, certainly uh, with with the markets in 1920 and then in the risk markets in 21, where we have for years have had low, low rates going lower, uh, very, very handsome returns uh, in in the public fixed income markets. And so in an odd way, uh, this is actually kind of a good education for a lot of us in the market that this really can happen, even though we haven't mm. seen it in a very long time. Uh, the only other thing I would say is a potential benefit is one of the things that we had been uh, whining about for the past several years with rates low and going lower was that we couldn't get any yield in the market. Well, you know, one of the things that we've done is kept our portfolio duration extremely short, which even though we're still playing catch up with the market, uh, we have some decent turnover in the portfolio so we can actually uh, implement some of these higher interest rates and higher yields into the portfolio. Ultimately, that'll give us more cushion uh, going forward with with uh, with respect to returns. So, mm. if I had to try to find some benefits of higher rates to a fixed income sector, those would be the only two I can kind of sort of find. So, I want to finish us off with well, we've got the negative and we've got the uh, quote unquote positive here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what is your view of the remainder of 2022? What do you see the market doing and leading us into 2023? How do you see the market progressing from its current state? Uh, unfortunately, I think it's going to be more of the same. Uh, I, you know, one of the one of the benefits that we had in 2021 uh, in the overall uh, returns is that the risk assets, equities, high yield. Uh, performed quite well. So mm. having a diversified investment strategy actually paid off because you got some you got some good tailwinds from the risk markets, even though the investment grade public markets didn't do well. Uh, private markets generally uh, did well as well, uh, in addition to the risk markets. What we're seeing in 2022 uh, is that the risk markets, high yield equities are are performing just as poorly uh, as as what we're seeing in the fixed income markets, and it's and it's really really strange in the high grade fixed income sectors or the investor grade fixed income sectors to see negative returns uh, that are in double digits. That's 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 quite abnormal uh, in the investment grade arena. So uh, with the Fed uh, and some of the other global central banks uh, certainly communicating that they're going to continue to be aggressive uh, and maybe even more aggressive than they already have been. In fighting the inflation bug, uh, I can't imagine that we're going to see any any relief from what we've experienced year to date anytime soon. So I think 22 uh, is is pretty much uh, baked in as with with what we've seen, and what what I want to believe will come will be an output of this is that we see a longer time horizon in viewing. Uh, uh, portfolio performance, because one of the things that tends to happen, especially with a, uh, any kind of a public uh, company, is that you're very quarterly centric. So it's not unusual as a portfolio manager of a public, uh, of some kind of public portfolio, where you're going to get a call, you know, in the last couple of weeks of every quarter to see what you can do uh, to to kind of help what the quarter is going to look like. Um, mm -hmm. In, a, in, in other companies like, like ours, we're looking at it on an annual basis. Uh, but if you're a true strategic investor, one of the things that, I, that, that, that I'm, I'm observing in a market that is uh, down for as long as this one has been, given that the last time we saw a downturn, it was less than a month long, it was March of 2020. And then mm -hmm. it, like no sooner was, did it start that it was almost over. The recovery began. Uh, that's not the case right now, and so it will hopefully force some folks that do believe or describe themselves as strategic investors to 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 develop a longer time horizon, something more than just this six months and the next six months. You know, maybe uh, ideally a three to five year type horizon. Some really interesting endpoints there. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, 
Rip will be speaking at our Institutional Fixed Income Investor in North America 2022, uh, which is going to be virtual on the 19th of October 2022. I believe it starts at 9 a.m. Eastern time. So Rip will have just had his coffee, so he'll be full of opinions and he'll have lots to say in one of his uh, final appearances before he leaves us for retirement. So I'd like to thank Rip for his time today. I'm Andrew Betwade. I'm the editor of insuranceinvestor.com. And thank you very much for watching.